Good morning and afternoon colleagues. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to the webinar Adopting Anticipatory Action and Shock Response of Social Protection to Strengthen Disaster Preparedness and Resilience, Learnings from the ASEAN Region. I hope you can all hear me well. If you have any technical problems, please write in the chat box and we'll, you'll be assisted by our fabulous Zoom team. Um, this event today is co-hosted with the ASEAN Secretariat and the Asia Pacific Technical Working Group on Anticipatory Action. It is facilitated by our core platform as an ongoing series led by FAO's Office of Emergencies and Resilience. CORE is a knowledge sharing platform that works towards generating learning and distributing evidence-based knowledge to support decision making and program processes. This event is also made possible through the two thanks of the European Union under the partnership program contributing to the global network against food crises. And hi, my name is Catherine Jones. I am the Anticipatory Action Lead for Asia and the Pacific based out of FAO's regional office in Bangkok. But I also wear another hat as co-chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Technical Working Group on Anticipatory Action. And I'll be your MC for today and moving you through the different parts of the webinar. In regards to logistics, the webinar today is split into two sections. The first is based on looking at the adoption, institutionalization and financing of anticipatory action and shock response of social protection within ASEAN. The second half will showcase the impact of COVID-19 cash transfers. And after these two presentations, we'll address as many of those questions as I was saying above in that Q&A box, so do keep them coming. Today we have a great lineup of speakers to dive into these two topics and today we provided welcoming remarks from Director Susanna Yanko, who is the Office of Civil Defence of the Philippines and also the co-chair of ACDM Working Group on Prevention and Mitigation. Mr Davide Zappa, who is the thematic lead on disaster preparedness for DG ECHO. We also have Ms Hang Pham, who is a Senior Resilience Officer for FAO's um, Regional Office for Asia Pacific. And after these welcoming words and being able to set the scene in that way, we then move into those thematic areas that I was talking about before, which will be led by our independent consultant, Ms. Zoe Scott, who led the evaluation to really come to these results of a multi-purpose, uh, multi-partner, sorry, um, evaluation of a project in ASEAN. And she'll be sharing those critical findings with us today. We're also joined by an expert panel to help us really deep dive into these specific key themes that we're going to go through today. And then one of them is Dr. Rianti Diante, who is Assistant Director for Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance Division with ASEAN. Ms. Emma Flahertley, who is a thematic lead for the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership, also known as the REAP. We also have Thuy An, who is a program analyst for UN Women in Vietnam, and Ms. Laika Saranas, who is the Chief of Staff, Ministry of Social Services and Development for BAM in the Philippines. So we've got a really packed agenda, but some really great speakers to come and shed some light on their experiences on both anticipatory action, shock response of social protection and cash transfers. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand the floor to Director Susanna to officially open our event and provide some welcoming remarks. Director, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my privilege to welcome you all to this webinar entitled Adopting Anticipatory Action and Shock Responsive Social Protection to Strengthen Disaster Preparedness and Resilience that is learning and experiences from the ASEAN region. I want to thank you all for making time available to join the webinar and share, and share your perspective on this important topic. The issue of climate change is a major concern to ASEAN, as Southeast Asia is one of the most at risk regions in the world. Countries are exposed to a variety of climate related hazards, including flood, typhoon, droughts, and extreme temperatures. However, technological advances are making it easier than ever before to forecast natural hazards. With that growing availability of information comes a growing responsibility to act on it. Anticipatory action and shock responsive social protection are becoming critical tools in the ASEAN region and around the globe to protect lives and livelihoods rather than waiting for the worst to materialize. I would like to thank the ASEAN Secretariat alongside the Asia Pacific Regional Technical Working Group on Anticipatory Action for hosting this webinar. And we look forward to discussing how far we have to come 
these approaches but critically look forward to where we need to go. We are all strong advocates for both approaches with the recent developments of guidelines, including the ASEAN guidelines on disaster responsive social protection to increase resilience established in 2020, and the forthcoming ASEAN framework on anticipatory action and disaster management. We are looking forward to putting these guidelines further into action over the coming years. We trust that we are not alone with this fight as we many partners putting forward their efforts and various contributions of our policies producing meaningful and tangible outputs and outcomes in many of our vulnerable communities. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to the various supports provided and for taking initiatives to build knowledge and share learning in the region, such as this webinar. Lessons learned on cash transfers in response to COVID-19 will also be drawn upon from cash transfer pilots to 10,000 households in Myanmar, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Critical outcomes for this activity can shape the way cash is delivered, pulled through social protection programs in the future. It is important to take stock of these findings and how they can be applied to anticipatory action and shock responsive social protection programming moving forward. We look forward to the discussion ahead and thank you very much. Let us all stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the welcoming words, Director. And I really like how you framed it. We're in this fight together and really focusing on that collaboration aspect. So really thanks for bringing that through right in the forefront of this webinar today. Um, I would like to hand the floor to um, Davide Zappa from DG Echo to provide us with a little bit more of setting the scene and, and build up what Director Susanna has just said. Over to you, Davide. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to all of your colleagues. My name is David Zappa. I work as a regional disaster preparedness thematic expert for DG Echo across the Asia Pacific region from Bangkok. Reflecting back to the time when in 2019, we decided to finance what proved to be a very successful partnership between ASEAN and FAO, together with a number of other DG Echo partners. We are very encouraged that having joined our forces to act before crisis and forge a sustainable and resilient future, leaving no one behind, has paid important dividends. This is because our partnership happened at a really critical juncture, as this is a moment in time when all hands on deck are needed. Today, like then, global humanitarian needs are at an all-time high and continue to grow. Even ahead of the onset of the unfolding crisis in Ukraine and Afghanistan, some 237 million people were forecasted to require humanitarian assistance this year, meaning a 40% increase, increase of last year, while extreme poverty has risen in 2020 for the first time in 22 years. In 2019, likewise today, crisis continue to be driven by fragility and conflict, amplified by climate change, and the impact of, was, of what was to unfold as COVID-19 pandemic. Those who are most vulnerable and marginalized are often the least prepared for acting early, ahead of recurrent and protective hazards manifestation in the Asia Pacific region and elsewhere, including situations of conflict, crisis, and violence, which have further compounded their vulnerabilities. The partnership we discussed today has delivered an unequivocal powerful message. Investing in preparing for and to act early pays dividend. We know that our collection, collective action to date, for example, by supporting the definition of the ASEAN disaster response and social protection to increase the resilience guidelines, has contributed to an unprecedented response by ASEAN member states in terms of scale, speed, and magnitude to respond to COVID-19. Evidence that anticipatory action saves lives, reduces needs, and contributes to protect developmental gains is also growing. What we then called innovative approaches are now well embedded in the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response, ADMER, and its work plan 2021-2025. In our own DGECO DP policy guidance, the DP guidance note, 
We have also prominently featured how we view preparedness as a way to promote anticipation, earliness, and flexibility as critical elements to manage disasters more efficiently and effectively and mitigating their impact. This is very encouraging, but we need to collectively do more. In DG ECO's views, three key dimensions would continue to call for our collective concern and action. Firstly, DG ECO's targeted DP investment has certainly contributed to support the normative space definition within the ASEAN. More remains to be done after substantive foundational work has been laid, as this is of vital importance to percolate at all administrative levels. Secondly, the evidence base of anticipatory action remains elusive. In the run-up to the Asia-Pacific Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction later in 2022, the initiative that we are discussing today, as well as new partnerships such as the FAO DG Eco Programmatic Partnership, offer us a very important opportunity to make anticipatory action an integral part of the design of humanitarian programs and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. For this, I cannot emphasize enough how crucial credible metrics are as part of any project deliverables. Third and lastly, the best use of limited humanitarian financing is to test anticipatory action approaches, which should be then costed by states within known systems, inclusive of shock response to social protection. This is about tools as well as toolboxes. We are, there, we are thereby clear that the role of DG ECO is not to substitutively finance anticipatory action approaches, but rather to promote their replication and sustainability potential, like we will hear today. We must harness our practice and elevate our message to its full potential, as preparing for and acting early ahead of shocks and crises is pressing. Let me conclude with reaffirming that DG ECO's approach is always to put people at the center of what we do, leveraging investments we make to reinforce local preparedness and response capacity, whenever possible working at system level. We at DG ECO are looking forward to continue partnering with you in this discourse to contribute to identifying clearly and measurable commitments to close the identified gaps and scale up anticipatory action. Thank you. Thanks so much, Davide, for those encouraging words and backing from DG ECHO in this area of work. I really like the point that you, you hinted at the end there on sustainability. We've got to really look towards how can we grow these systems, but also make them sustainable in the future. So thanks for highlighting that among many points um, to lay down the scene for us today. Um, I'll now like to pass the floor to my colleague, Ms. Hung Pam, um, to provide a little bit more on the, the setting the scene. So Hung, over to you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Davide, uh, Director Susanna and Davide for the ins very inspiring opening remarks. Maybe allow me to just add a little bit on the background of the initiatives that FAO, DG Eco, and other partners have been supporting in the ASEAN regions, the learning from which we are sharing today in this webinar. So um, well, Davide mentioned the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response as a very kind of like inspiring tool that many of us commit to support the implementations in the way ASEAN is spearheading disaster management globally. But the ASEAN is also very much ahead of the game in seeing the role of social protections in strengthening disaster preparedness and resilience reflected through the regional declarations on social protection in 2013 and the regional framework for implementations. And these two framework, as well as many other enabling policy in the ASEAN have been the entry point for us uh, to look at this agenda of anticipatory action and shock responsive social protections in the regions. Uh, so we, we started actually in, in 2017 with two parallel initiatives su supported by DG ECO, piloting the drought anticipatory actions in Vietnam and unpacking what shock responsive social protections would mean for countries in the regions in Cambodia, Myanmar, Philippines, and Vietnam. And the result is learning from uh, the piloting of anticipatory action, as well as developing the shock responsive social protection country roadmap and the ASEAN disasters uh, responsive social protection guideline. So in the following years, uh, with continuous support from DG ECO, we try to implement the ASEAN disaster responsive social protection guidelines and the country roadmap while setting up 
the anti-spatry action system in the countries and trying to align ourselves with national social protections and disaster management systems in the countries, while also seeing how these two approaches actually link and maximize our effort in disaster preparedness and, and, and response. So um, in, in, uh, in the, the same period as Derek C. Susanna mentioned, there were opportunity for us to pilot the cash transfer in response to COVID-19, but also seeing whether we can piggybacking on the national social protection, social assistance programs and learning from there, how we can do it better in the future. So ultimately, as Catherine mentioned, for sustainability, we aim for the take up of anticipatory action and shock responsive social protections by governments, humanitarian, as well as development partners to strengthen the disaster preparedness, making humanitarian and development assistance more effective, more resilient to disasters and addressing the, address, the humanitarian and development as well as peace nexus is not easy. We are learning a lot in that journey that we are sharing today. And I really look forward for our discussions to see how together collectively we can promote these innovative approaches to make our world a more resilient place for everybody. Thank you and over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Hung, and thank you for bringing through that key word, resilience. That's something we really need to keep in our mind when we're looking at anticipatory action and shock response of social protection in the ASEAN region. So keep that kind of thought in your mind about how can we connect this better to resilience and the resilience models in the region. And feel free to write any questions down in the chat box if you've got anything you would like us to move forward or, or dissect in this conversation today. So we, we've had a, a great kind of opening and welcoming remarks that allows us to understand why is this topic important. But now we're going to be moving to how has this happened? What have we done so far? So really answering that key question. And I'd like to invite to the floor Ms. Zoe Scott to help us dive into that and really explore where have we gone with the anticipatory action and shock response of social protection agenda over the past few years. Zoe, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I just to start off, I apologize. My internet connection is a little bit choppy this morning. Uh, so please bear with me. Um, so as um, Catherine, from around September to December last year, um, I conducted an independent evaluation um, of the, um, the work that FAO had been doing with other agencies and NGOs across the region. We particularly had case studies in Vietnam, the Philippines, Cambodia and Myanmar. Um, but despite having those specific case studies, we were looking at progress across the region with anticipatory action and shock responsive social protection. So what I want to do, first of all, is I want to check that we're all talking about the same thing when we say anticipatory action and shock responsive social protection, because I found very much through the conversations I had with people during the evaluation that these terms meant different things to different people and to different organizations. So to be really clear up front, by anticipatory action, I'm talking about actions that are triggered by a forecast and anticipate the shock. I'm not talking about kind of just general preparedness activities, but it has to be actions that are triggered by a forecast. When I say shock responsive social protection, I'm talking about when social protection systems and programs have been scaled up as a way of getting support to people quickly. Now you can scale them up in an anticipatory way and get support to people ahead of a shock, but more often than not, the way this is done is that and they're scaled up after a shock, for example, COVID-19, and they become a way of um, channeling response after the shock. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the specific evaluation questions that we were addressing um, were, we have three overarching questions. The first one, to what extent have ACN member states adopted and institutionalized anticipatory action and shock response to social protection? And what are the key lessons learned? The second question is what progress has been made and what lessons can be learned on how to best support strategic and sustainable financing for anticipatory action and shock response to social protection. So I'm going to talk about these two questions first, then we'll take uh, some discussion from the panel and then I'll come back and present on the third question, which is what are the impacts on beneficiaries and what lessons can be learned from the COVID-19 transfers that the project undertook in Vietnam, Myanmar and the Philippines. So in terms of this question of to what extent have ACN member states adopted an institution? I do fear we may have lost Zoe. 
Is that just me or everyone? Okay, no problem. I can come in and present the, the rest of her slides and hopefully she'll join us a, a little bit later. Um, so in regards to the adoption and institutionalization of anticipatory action, there's been a rapid and impressive acceptance of anticipatory action and shock response of social protection across the ASEAN and within member states over recent years with multiple examples that we've seen in the ASEAN and the member states strongly owning and committing to the approaches to a clear regional policy framework in place. And we've seen that in, in regards to, for instance, the anticipatory action really growing in, in the, the Philippines and in other areas. Oh, Zoe, I see that you're back with us again. It, it has to happen at least once in one webinar. Yeah. I'll hand it back to you. I was just explaining the first point. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so on, the, so then if I go on to the second point, which was that the, you know, the project really did play a key role in the success. As somebody who's an evaluator, it's quite unusual for there to be, uh, for all different stakeholders to have a unanimous view that a project has played a key role, but that was the case with this project. So that was that was really good to see. And one thing that was quite unusual was this um, two pronged approach in that was embedded in the design of the project, which was um, that there would be regional collaboration through ASEAN at a regional level, um, but that that would be combined with country level engagement. And we found that that was really quite mutually reinforcing. So what maybe discussions were happening at, happening at a regional level um, where these approaches were being promoted, government officials were going to those regional meetings, hearing about things going on in other countries, took that learning home, tried things out in their own country, and then they also took their learning back to the regional forum. So really that was quite a mutually reinforcing approach, which I think it's worth flagging. However, I think it's fair to say that whilst there's quite a lot of progress with the um, adoption and acceptance of anticipatory action and shock responsive social protection as ideas, I think there's less progress has been made on the actual implementation of the, the approaches. I have to say, I think that's understandable. Um, the, for both of these approaches, they require enormous changes in government machinery and in the way that um, all the different stakeholders, including humanitarian actors work and, and really the way that we think about disasters and disaster response. So, and not just that, we also, the project was trying to be implemented in the context of a huge pandemic. Um, and as you know, I don't need to remind everybody on the call how disruptive that has been to all kinds of development and humanitarian programming. So whilst COVID-19 was a barrier to progress it, to a certain extent, I also want to flag, though, that it did offer governments the opportunity and the incentive to actually put shock response of social protection into practice, often for the very first time. And we'll come back to that. And this wasn't just in the ACN region. This was globally. A lot of governments suddenly kind of sprang into action and used social protection in a way that they hadn't previously. OK. Um, so um, part of the um, project, part of the evaluation, what we were doing was we were trying to identify key enablers for anticipatory action and, show and key barriers um, to the approaches. Enablers, we found uh, the strong came across was um, a strong institutional architecture with interagency coordination. Um, now, there were countries like Cambodia that had taken really big steps forward in this regard, and it became, it was really clearly important because anticipatory action and shock response to social protection sort of sit in this um, or can fall between the gaps between development, humanitarian, climate, different line ministries, different UN agencies, that actually having a mechanism that, that coordinates and brings together the different ministries and different agencies can be very, very beneficial. Um, we also found a key enabler was um, having high impact disasters like COVID-19. It just pushes it up the political agenda and the whole awareness of how we need to plan and we need to prepare. Um, as I've mentioned, having ACN engagement was really beneficial. Uh, also having support from humanitarian agencies. Um, and by support, I don't just mean the fact that humanitarian agencies have been talking quite, there's quite a lot of noise at the moment about anticipatory action and shock response to social protection, but there's also actual finance, for example, uh, the SURF, the DREF, uh, the START Fund, there's opportunities to access real money to kind of have a go at implementing um, anticipatory action. 
So those were the, the key enablers that we identified. However, there were also a lot of barriers to anticipatory action and shock response of social protection. Um, the biggest one by far that was repeatedly mentioned was accessing finance and not just accessing finance to be able to do anticipatory action and shock response of social protection, but just getting that finance to flow through the system. So really, particularly from a government perspective, there are lots of uh, public financial management challenges in terms of actually being able to access money ahead of a disaster. I'll talk a bit more about that um, in, in a moment. Um, there's also another barrier is just a lack of trust in forecasts. That's probably something that a lot of people on the call will be familiar with. Um, confusion over terminology. I mentioned this at the beginning. This was a major problem. Um, lots of people in government said that they just don't understand what these terms mean. They feel new. They make, they make them feel a bit uncomfortable. They're not quite sure the differences or that kind of thing. Um, also limited capacity, uh, technical capacity, particularly for anticipatory action. So that's around setting triggers and thresholds and forecasting. Uh, poor coordination, and finally, lack of compelling evidence. I think there was a feeling that there are kind of a few studies um, of that are, you know, piecemeal, um, but there's not like a strong body of evidence that is really compelling if you're a government official. To shift from this kind of the creating the policy environment that has successfully been done but we now need to shift attention onto actual implementation and moving beyond these kind of piecemeal pilots that use parallel systems to actually something that is scalable. Okay, so the next question that we looked at was, um, as Catherine mentioned, was around the sustainable financing, strategic and sustainable financing for anticipatory action and shock response and social protection. Um, so we found that there had been some initial progress around this whole question of how should the approaches be financed at the regional level, but there was less um, focus on it at the country level. And overall, it hadn't been as much of a focus um, of the work as setting this kind of um, the more regional policy piece had. Uh, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 has prompted more government financing of shock responses, social protection than has ever been seen in the region. And that is a really positive potential tipping point. I think, you know, we could uh, really build on this and, and go forward from here. Um, However, when you think about anticipatory action, it's a bit different in terms of the Philippines was the only country where we found government had actually used their own budget for, um, for anticipatory action. And actually that, there was only one example of that at a local level and it hadn't triggered at the time of the evaluation. So, um, it, it, so, so there's a difference in the way that shock response to social protection and anticipatory action are being financed. Um, one has taken steps forward with being government financed, but anticipatory action is still very much in the donor space. Um, and, and part of the reason for this, I think, is, you know, that major changes to budgeting and public financial management are required for, for both of these approaches to be implemented. Um, in some countries, you know, there are anti-corruption laws, for example, that mean it's just not possible in, in the current architecture for finances to be released ahead of a disaster. So there's, there's a lot that needs to happen in terms of the, the mechanics or the pipe work, if you like, to to mean that finance can flow to these sorts of initiatives. Um, that all means, I, I mean, I'm sure most of you would be aware, if we just go back to the previous slide, that you know, public financial management is, is not something that happens overnight and legal reform doesn't happen overnight. So it, we need to be quite mindful that some of these changes will take quite a long time. They will take high levels of government commitment. Um, and in particular, they will take collaboration with ministries of finance. And I think that's something that we could get a bit better at um, is actually um, collaborating with ministries of finance, development banks, maybe it's a more familiar partner than for some of the, the people on, on the call. We just need to move on to the next slide. It's the one with the diet. And um, here we are. Right. OK, so as I said, there's actually quite a limited set of financial instruments that are being used to pay for anticipatory action and shock response to social protection. 
um, in the region. As I mentioned, anticipatory action is typically financed by humanitarian agencies. Um, so that's very much, if you, if you look at the diagram here, um, the uh, instruments lift, listed on the left are arranged ahead of a shock, and the instruments on the right are arranged after a shock. So anticipatory action is very much being um, paid for out of that um, yellow block at the top. So it's, it's kind of pre-arranged humanitarian, so donor-led funding for that. Shock response to social protection, um, in contrast, is typically being funded by ex post instruments. It's not being um, arranged in advance. And that's all of those ones on the right. And we did find examples of, of all of them, um, including you know, money coming from um, the humanitarian sector, also post disaster credit, and then budget reallocation. So that's when a government has to sort of hastily redo their budgets to try to release money for this kind of thing. And um, I think it's, it's so there's a lot of instruments that aren't being used and I think it was I found it quite interesting that there was actually quite little knowledge or appetite uh, for using some of them particularly insurance and contingent credit lines there were uh, there was le much less attention on that um, in people's thinking of how to finance um, these approaches so just to wrap up I'll share a few uh, recommendations that came out of this um, this analysis so first of all we found that um, kind of future programming needs a clearer, more coherent and cohesive narrative and design with a budget that matches the scope and ambition. So um, I would say in because this was a multi country, quite different activities took place in the different countries, and maybe they could have been more coordinated. Um, and very much it was like people either worked on anticipatory action, or they worked on shock response to social protection. Unfortunately, the, the work didn't quite get to the point of being able to look at synergies between the two and look at maybe how social protection systems could be used in an anticipatory way, for example. I would also say that I think it's phenomenal what was able to be done with a, quite a small budget. The budget was uh, you know, around 3 million and the scope and the ambition for this was enormous. And so it was a tight time scale and a tight budget uh, for, for what was able to be achieved. The second recommendation, and I think I've made this point, is that really we need to pivot now and focus on country level implementation and building government systems for this, for these approaches. Thirdly, as I said, we really need to do more work on financing, including looking at a country level at what kind of people. I think Zoe may have dropped out again, so I'll just follow up from what she was saying. So unfortunately, as you know, with webinars, sometimes we get a little bit of uh, uh, internet issues, but no problem. As she was saying, in regards to more work is needed on financing, including the PFM reform to support the flow of funds, strategic use of instruments and work with MDBs and the Ministry of Finances as well, which is really important to really see how can we make these approaches sustainable in the future. We really need to think about that financing side and their kind of role to play in the wider scheme when it comes to the financing of anticipatory actions and shock responsive social protection. We also we also need to build capacities for anticipatory action and early warning, particularly designing anticipatory action triggers and thresholds, which can be a bit of a sticking issue for some areas and people. It does take some scientist um, kind of science rigor to really understand that kind of area of work. Um, so it's really good to, to build that up in, in that capacity as well. Um, Zoe, I was just on point four, but I'll hand you back for, for point five. Thank you. Um, and so also, we, I think we need to upgrade to more strategic monitoring and evaluation. At the moment, we're doing, you know, a, an evaluation over here and one evaluation of a small project over here and maybe a lessons learned review in another um, area that's, that's not kind of coordinated and strategic to build up into something that's really compelling and convincing. So I think we need to be strategic about the evidence generation and monitoring and evaluation work that we're doing, but also not just the commissioning of that work, but the sharing of it. Um, and then sixthly, I think we need to clarify the terminology that we that we're using. That was such a barrier. Honestly, I I cannot overemphasize that one enough. We really need to get much better as a international community at what we're talking about and what we mean by these terms and just continually rehearsing them and being really strict with ourselves in in how we use these terms. 
Okay, so thank you. And thank you for bearing with me. Um, I do apologize again for the internet issues. So I'm going to hand over really quickly um, to two of our panelists. So um, Dr. Rianti Gelanti uh, from ACN. So I, I wanted to ask you a question because I I mentioned about how this two pronged approach had worked very well um, with having work at a regional level and work at a country level. And um, could you explain to us how ACN is planning to kind of continue in this area and continue to encourage these approaches in ACN member states? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Zoe, for the opportunity uh, for the very informative presentation uh, on the results of the study on how ASEAN uh, uh, have implemented our program on uh, social uh, shock responsive social protection and anticipatory action. So let me uh, respond to your question on uh, how would we, we implement this uh, through the topic of disaster financing and uh, uh, looking forward. So I would like to uh, highlight here uh, two major mechanisms uh, uh, related to financing to take uh, this uh, forward. So the first is through the Admar Work Program 2021-2025, and also the ASEAN Disaster Risk Finance and Insurance Program, which is cross-sector in nature. I will explain both uh, in great detail. So the Admar Work Program 2021-2025 uh, was uh, developed based on the foundation uh, with the uh, of Admar with the mission to enhance su uh, and support ASEAN disaster risk reduction and disaster management through uh, various uh, mechanisms, intersectoral cooperation, capacity building, innovation, mobilization, partnership, and stronger coordination. So particularly, uh, one of the seven guidelines uh, within this Atma Work Program uh, is related to finance and resource mobilization. And particularly in the priority program two of prevention mitigation, we have outcome related to the calls for expanded reach of ASEAN disaster risk financing and insurance program in the region. So then let me highlight you know, some of these opportunities, uh, which uh, potentially this SRSV and anticipatory action uh, can be considered uh, through the ASEAN disaster risk finance and insurance. So the ASEAN uh, Disaster Risk uh, Financing uh, uh, Risk and Financing Roadmap was jointly developed uh, by three sectoral bodies. So Zoe, you mentioned on you know the need for this uh, cross-sectoral cooperation, particularly with the finance sector. So here uh, on. ADRFI, we have ASEAN Finance and Central Banks Deputies Meeting, ASEAN Insurance Regulator Meetings, and ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management, who are the members of uh, the ADRFI uh, uh, mechanism. There are three uh, important phases to highlight on you know, how uh, ADRFI have been taken by ASEAN. So first, uh, uh, which was done in the past 2016, 2017, um, is, this is on the uh, phase one of the RFI. It looks at risk information, assessment and modeling, public policy development, knowledge management and training. Of course, uh, we looked at some of uh, the, these programs in detail. Uh, during that time, uh, so responsive social protection, anticipatory action may not necessarily be uh, a part of the major agenda. Then in phase two of the RFI, it moves forward to impact focus the RFI program. So the program looks at uh, three initiatives, improving data, harnessing risk advisory, and also enhancing capacity building uh, among ASEAN member in ex ante disaster risk financing. So thank you so much for uh, the presentation on these various options uh, and by which uh, financing for uh, anticipatory action and um, are located. And this is something that uh, uh, can uh, will be taken forward uh, in terms of ACDM participation in uh, the RFI. And finally, uh, this is currently being uh, uh, consulted uh, to uh, anticipate and to respond to the um, to the impact of COVID. The scope of uh, uh, DRFI phase two is expanded uh, to include other risks and particularly pandemic health risks. So here, the activities will be to collect comprehensive data on uh, pandemic health risks to define limits of contingency reserve. This is also potentially where we can consider some of uh, these um, trigger points uh, and, uh, and identification of uh, 
potential financing options that be included, as well as socialization of public policies and strategies. So here we have, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, building with, uh, armed with data, capacity building, risk advisory, uh, the AMS will be in a, a better position to consider and put uh, together comprehensive disaster resilience financing, which, uh, you know, cater for disaster management needs, including SRSP and anticipatory action. Uh, finally, we would like to also highlight uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN ACADM is in the process of uh, developing or finalizing the ASEAN framework on anticipatory action in disaster management. This provides guidance for defining and contextualizing anticipatory action uh, at the regional level with some consideration on progress at the national level for the ASEAN member states. Uh, we hope that this framework is forward looking it defines the building blocks, including some of the uh, action plan 2021-2025 uh, to, uh, to mainstream, of course, anticipatory action and disaster management through the regional efforts. Uh, one thing that we see here uh, on your recommendation of the studies, uh, this uh, uh, definitely be considered and will be considered as part of uh, the implementation of uh, or identification of the action plan uh, for uh, uh, the framework of anticipatory action in disaster management 2021-2025. Thank you, Zoe. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gelanti. Um, and if I could go now to um, Emma Flatty from um, REAP. And um, Emma, just we uh, REAP is obviously a global um, partnership. Really keen to understand whether these recommendations and the experiences from the evaluation resonate outside just the ASEAN region. Uh, what's what's your view on that? Thanks, Zoe, and and thanks to to all partners for having us here today. I think yes. Um, the, when we saw the results of this evaluation, um, it resonated a lot with what we're hearing from partners in REAP, um, but also some of our own recent research we recently conducted um, and released a state of play on early action um, report, which tries to take a bit of a global stock take of where we are on this. Um, and if these are issues that are coming up at a global level, I mean, of course, there's a there's a high level of contextualization to the um, to the countries that are studied, not least because ASEAN countries tend to be um, quite advanced in some of these, um, in some of the approaches to things like disaster risk financing and like shock responsive social protection. But I wanted to kind of, um, focus on the four findings that really, really resonate with what we're seeing at a global and, and, and regional policy level. Um, the first, which you've drawn a lot of attention to, Zoe, is the terminology. Um, we were really seeing over the last two years of REAP, because for those who don't know, REAP is a fairly wide alliance of, of different partners working on early action, including governments, um, financing institutions and countries, humanitarian organizations, climate actors, development actors, private sector. It's a very, very broad um, partnership because that's what's necessary to take early action to scale. But what that meant it became apparent really quickly that we're often um, talking at odds with each other about different terminology or using terms interchangeably. And that in itself is a serious barrier to actually um, coordinating in a way that will have impact and um, so we received quite a strong push from our partners that we needed to provide some sort of, a, if not a glossary, a phrase book. So we were really happy to see that that has also come across in this evaluation. And we're working really closely with the um, with the partners, the, uh, the ASEAN partners now on the development of, of both the, the terminology or phrase book for that, as well as ours, because it is when we go to governments, we need to be able to to talk about social shock response to social protection and early action in a way that is understandable and coherent and clear um, and to all to to a certain to as much as an extent as possible speak with, with one voice um, so I think that that is a major major um, issue that we're really glad to see um, reflected in this report um, and to work with the ASEAN partners on it going forward um, the other one around the forecasting and the trust in forecasting this is a huge issue we've got we've made so many advances in in um the production of early warnings and um, a little bit less so on the dissemination of early warnings we probably have more access to information about how predictable crises are than ever before um but there is issues around how it's disseminated how it's understood but also when we're going to speak to governments about making huge financial decisions um we need to be able to speak to them in their language. We need to understand their risk tolerance. 
Um, and we need to understand all of the other things that they are trying to balance decision to, to act on, whether the crisis, whether it's before or after a crisis. And Zoe, you've alluded to some of that in your findings. For example, the, the complexity, the incredible complexity of public financial management systems and how um, we need to acknowledge that, I think, when we engage with governments, whether it's at a national or a local level, the different challenges that they're having, understand their risk tolerance, understand when they need to receive risk information in order to make a decision and also to understand and respect what's the level of uncertainty they're willing to work with. Um, and I think this relates as well to the recommendation on evidence. Um, we, as a sector, um, as well, I don't know if we call early action sector yet, but as a community, um, we need to do more to collate the evidence that's available to make it um, more widely known. I think Zoe is um, focused in on that as well as that we're not great as actors at sharing the evidence around the place. Um, but also to stop perhaps make create collecting evidence on the same things. We have quite a good degree of evidence available now for humanitarian anticipatory interventions, but they're quite project focused. Um, and they are maybe quite often qualitative and that's not the kind of evidence that's going to enable a government decision maker to make um, decisions. They need different kinds of evidence um, than um, non-governmental organizations and we need to work with the governments to understand that them, them understand that for them so that we from them so that we can we can provide support accordingly and I think one of the things Reef is trying to do on that at the moment is the development of a sort of evidence roadmap where we can plot out where across the whole value chain of early action so all the way from those early warning productions to uh, the boots hitting the ground um, understanding where is there evidence that exists already and how could it be used in working with governments and institutions, but where are the gaps and I think what we'll find and we've seen from research done by the Centre for Disaster Protection and the Ensure Resilience Project um, Ensure Resilience Partnership is that we're not there yet in terms of evidence for early action and social protection and more so on social protection we're doing well, but um, evidence about um, how national or GDP expenditure is going on that. And I think that then the finance issue, as always, is, is massive. Um, both early warning, early action and social protection require more investment and different kinds of investment. We need to understand how they're being paid for now, what's the potential in terms of how it could be paid for in the future, but what are also the, the, the challenges and the very specific challenges that governments have around this. Um, and I think, you know, Social protection and early action, they're not panaceas, they're not silver bullets alone, and they're certainly not together a silver bullet, but there is huge potential, particularly in some of the ASEAN countries, where if we invest in the systems building for both of them, um, it will have dividends for both areas. We can, and, and REAP um, released a paper on this in conjunction with FCDO, uh, the UK office, a number of social protection actors last year, where we kind of pointed out um, the potential there you know we couldn't use social protection systems to disperse early funding but also we can look at how early action and um, protocols and information can make social protection trigger in a more anticipatory way so there's all this potential there but it requires systems investment and systems building but also the systems need to be fueled you know we can do lots of these great scoping exercises and we can do lots of regional and global collaboration but unless money is put into the social protection system or put into the funds that can have anticipation windows um it won't it won't, it's not going to it's not going to 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 have the impact that we want so i think i would kind of end there by saying you know what well, just referring to some of the work that um, was done in 2018 by Courtney Cabot Fenton, where every where she found that every dollar spent on safety net and re, um, resilience programming in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia resulted in net benefits of a minimum of two dollars thirty cents um, or maximum of three dollars and thirty cents. Like they're significant. That's the kind of numbers we need to give to, to governments, but also um, to Though it's not, we have to work. I think in REAP, our job is to be um, to be a support service, I suppose, to governments, and also recognizing that you know we do need to get the banks involved, and we do need to get the international financial institutions on board. So we want to work to provide greater guidance and greater evidence to governments, but also to work with them to um, produce the kind of evidence and case studies and 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 suggestions to. Um, the broader sector so that we can start to, to move things at scale in a sustainable way to more anticipatory approaches. So thanks very much, Zoe. 
Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Zoe, Dr. Yanti, and Emma for really diving into the whole anticipatory action shock response of social protection space. And I think we've got some really good learnings to take away from us. For one, coherency. That's something that for me is, is some that really kind of shone through your presentation, Zoe, and also through what Dr. Yanti and also what Emma was saying. And what's really exciting is that ASEAN are now producing their framework on anticipatory action and disaster management, which is aimed to be launched next to the GPDRR at the end of May. So keep an eye out for that. And hopefully that will help answer that key question or that key recommendation that you said, um, Zoe, is to really look at how can we bring coherency together. Um, I love the, the way that we were talking about evidence. It's good to know the good, the bad, the ugly. Like we really need to get that out there, not just shine a light on what's working, but really share with each other what isn't. I think that's e equally as important as what is working, because then we can learn from each other and really grow together. Again, going back to that point I said in the beginning, that Director Susanna also pointed out is collaboration. So making sure that that is at the core of what we're doing here. So we can see all these different strands and themes really, I think, flowing around nicely um, in this kind of anticipatory action shock responsive social protection space. Um, so thank you so much, Zoe, for um, highlighting that. I'm going to pass the floor back to you because now we're going to be looking at cash transfers for COVID-19, how they implemented, what they achieved. So over to you to answer those key questions for us. Thanks, Zoe. That's right. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so we're moving into the second um, mention main evaluation questions. Uh, the third question is that I put on the slide there. So what are the impacts um, on beneficiaries and what lessons can be learned from the pro project's COVID-19 transfers in Vietnam, Myanmar and the Philippines? So to explain the context for this, um, so the, there was an unplanned pivot um, of the project due to the pandemic. Um, as, as happened with many uh, different programs, the, um, when we got to kind of 2020, COVID-19 arrived in our world and um, many projects had to pivot and start doing slightly different things or doing things in different ways. So this project um, decided with support from ECHO DG to provide emergency cash transfers and also to support shock response with social protection where possible. Um, and as a result, over 10,000 households were reached at a cost of approximately 44,000 US dollars. Um, and cash transfers were provided in Myanmar, in Vietnam and in the Philippines. Um, and in Cambodia, a slightly different approach was taken. Support was provided to, um, to build uh, systems for social protection um, rather than actually the money being the cash transfers itself. Um, I would note that the project funded cash transfers came relatively late in the pandemic, particularly for some countries in the in the Philippines, it was actually over a year later. So I think um, that does raise questions to how much we can really genuinely call them shock response. Um, so yes, I wanted to make that point before we go on. Um, so in terms of impacts, the impacts of the cash transfers. Um, so we did surveys um, across multiple countries and the survey data suggested uh, for Vietnam and Myanmar that the cash was spent mainly on addressing acute basic needs. So it was predominantly food. People spent it to help meet their basic uh, predominantly food needs. Um, in the Philippines, it, where the cash arrived much later, it was slightly different. We found that the primary use of the cash was actually to support livelihoods. So it was spent um, on things like buying seeds and buying fertilizer. So that was quite interesting, just how the timing um, can have quite a different um, impact in the lives of beneficiaries and, and how they choose to spend the money. Um, in the Philippines, we were able to collect survey data about um, beneficiaries' feelings of um, negative coping strategies that they had taken um, or, or not taken as a result of the transfer. So the survey data suggested that the transfers had helped to avoid some negative um, coping strategies in the short term, particularly um, they'd reduced the need for households to take on more debt um, and stopped people from families from reducing their food consumption. Which as well. However, because the transfer value overall was, was we found that these benefits were short lived, um, which is unfortunately uh, something that's quite typical of social protection. You know, you're, you're giving somebody um, money in the heat of a crisis and you're 
you're not necessarily we have I think we have to be realistic about what is possible to achieve um, with with this kind of emergency cash transfer. Um, next slide. So in terms of uh, capacity generally for shock response to social protection through these cash transfers, it's important to understand that the way they were done in each country, it varied greatly the extent to which they leveraged existing social protection programs and systems. So, for example, at one end of the spectrum in one country, it, the, the cash transfers were given very much as a humanitarian agency delivering emergency cash transfers. They did try to work and collaborate with government and do shared work, for example, on targeting, but to generally speaking, they were delivered as emergency cash transfers. At the other end of the spectrum in other countries, then funds were just transferred to the government. This was the situation in the Philippines and the Philippines government were entirely responsible for the implementation of those cash transfers. So it was sort of, it was done very differently in each country. Um, overall, I would say that only a limited amount of sustainable capacity appears to have been built for shock response to social protection as a di direct result of the cash transfers. But I do want to flag that um, capacity building wasn't an explicit aim. And uh, just to remind everybody, this was something that this was a pivot. It wasn't part of the original design. So there wasn't they didn't have the luxury of a design period and working out a capacity building program to run alongside these cash transfers. It was and I'm sure we can all cast our minds back to early 2020 when, um, you know, it, it was difficult. Right. It wasn't easy. Um, so so, yes, I think. Um, more could be done in future if this sort of thing was if this sort of approach was taken in future more could be done to systematically uh, try to build capacity alongside the delivery of cash transfers um, I think we found some on the next slide please I think we found some quite interesting um, lessons around inclusivity um, so in several of the countries um, the the um, the agencies involved in this project were specifically encouraging governments that they needed to revise their eligibility because of the um, the enormity of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic to if you if governments just used their standard list of poor people from say three years ago they would be missing out COVID-19 were very close to being poor and probably dip below the line in, in the um, foreseeable future. So one of the lessons was for, for very large shocks like COVID-19, we need to revise the eligibility criteria. Um, secondly, um, it's important to run manual systems alongside digital systems. So um, for in shock responsive social protection generally there's quite a strong push towards using digital systems for payment for registration and they can be great they can be very effect cost effective they can really um, be a, a boost uh, for the efficiency of programs but we can't forget the digital divide and if we want to reach the more remote and poorer communities that can encounter challenges um, when, and when um, when using digital systems we have to run manual systems so manual registration systems manual payment systems alongside the digital ones um, thirdly and this is a particular bugbear of mine it's really really important to prioritize effective communication with beneficiaries in some of the cases we find scenarios where beneficiaries have been given say 24 hours notice that they needed to be in a certain place to collect their cash transfer we need to be mindful that that's not necessarily going to be possible or it's not going to enable people to travel safely to um, the um, the collection site so communication needs to be timely with beneficiaries it needs to give them adequate time to to access their services um, but it also needs to be in local languages using um, local channels um, then we also found um, the awareness of gender and m and &E documentation varied quite widely across the countries. Um, in some of the um, cash transfers were given exclusively to women. Some had much less understanding that women were being affected differently by COVID-19 from men. Um, and also the m and &E documentation varied in some countries did really well in doing surveys and follow-ups. Some that was a bit lacking. 
So I think um, I would add on like a final recommendation to the list of recommendations that I shared with you before, which is if you're going to be doing cash transfers, it's really important to consider inclusive, inclusivity quite systematically um, across the cash transfers. I'm not sure how much of that you got, <laughs> because I think I think the um, I got a message saying my internet was a bit unstable during that. So I do apologize. Um, I would like to go now to um, to ask a couple of questions from people who were involved in the implementation of those cash transfers. So well, unfortunately, Zoe's dropped off again. Um such as the way when we're dealing with internet um, in, in 2022. So thanks for bearing with us. But luckily I have the set of questions for me and exactly what Zoe was saying, we're very lucky to have um, individuals that have implemented these cash transfers on the ground and can give us some real hands-on experience on, on what has happened in regards to the implementation of these cash transfers and how they went about it and answering that critical question as well. So I'd like to welcome um, to the floor Ms. Thuyan um, from UN Women. And the question that we have for you today, um, Tuyan, is you managed to implement cash transfers with multiple risks in 2021, COVID-19, typhoons, flood, oh, there's a lot going on in, in Vietnam. Um, it is fair to say, is it still donor-led and what is needed to make this more government-driven and ex-ante in the future? So Tui, over to you for your answer and thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share our work uh, under the eco-funded FBF project in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the consortium in Vietnam, I would like to share with you uh, some of our um, experience in implementing the cash uh, transfer activity with the multiple rigs in Vietnam. Uh, so in uh, 2021, while we are implementing the FBF uh, uh, for drought uh, funded by the eco in the Kamau province, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic occurred and it really exacerbated the negative impact on life of the vulnerable people in, in the community in Kamau. Uh, additionally, it also caused a serious effect to our project implementation. And at the time, it was not possible to implement some of the project activity. Uh, but luckily that ECHO was flexible to respond to the emerging, uh, emerging shock and allow partners uh, to reprioritize uh, our project activity. Uh, so we have conducted the need assessment uh, to inform our design on intervention uh, to ensure that the support that we was going to do would meet the need of the vulnerable household, but also to complement uh, the government response. Um, uh, regarding the COVID. Uh, so at the time, uh, the government of Vietnam was introduced, uh, I mean, after the, the COVID-19 breakout, the government of Vietnam introduced a social assistance package through a cash transfer for the people affected by the COVID. So the government scheme targeted the poor household, I mean, as um, one of the findings that Joy has mentioned, that the poor household that in the official list of the commune poor household, and the workers in the in the workers in the formal sector that lost the job for at least three months, the workers doing the informal jobs, uh, but only in six specific types of jobs, such as waste picker, street vendor, motorbike taxi driver, lottery ticket seller on the trees. So like very specific um like um uh, occupation like jobs uh, in the informal jobs. And our assessment and consultation with the local community and local authority in Kamau have found that uh, the government cash transfer scheme have missed out some groups who would have the same level of vulnerability and also have the same negative impact as the group that the government supported. For example, like the group of the near poor household the group of the people that working or doing the informal jobs, but not in the six jobs listed by the government. Because I mean, we found that the six specific type of jobs are listed under the government scheme is more relevant uh, at the at the urban setting, but not in the in the in the like rural area area uh, such as uh, Kamau where we work. Uh, 
And this uh, group of people, they did not receive any support. And majority of them are women, migrant, and ethnic minority people. So based on our findings, uh, we um, our catch and for activity was designed to complement the government scheme by horizontally expanded the assistance. So we target uh, our program, our catch and for activity targeted the household who just live up from the poverty. So they was not in the list of the government, the near poor, the informal workers who are not in the government list and lost their job due to the COVID and those that income and livelihood are effect, affected by the drought as well. So uh, for that, we have uh, able to support like um, more than 800 household uh, in Kamau and uh, to meet their basic needs uh, due to the uh, affected by the COVID and the drought. And regarding the um, uh, the early action by the government, so at the at the moment in Vietnam, uh, it can be said that the government system has not that ready for the early action, both from the disaster man management side and from the social protection side. During the implementation of our FBI funding, uh, FBI project funded by the ECO in Vietnam, we have worked closely with the local government in two provinces and supported them in integration of the um, early action uh, into the disaster management uh, uh, planning and implementation at the local level. However, we also found some challenges. Uh, some of them have been mentioned by other speakers. Uh, for example, like um, the early action was implemented in some cases, such as the catch up, the cat support um, to for the people to buy roof for house strengthening before the typhoon in Kamau in 1918, uh, or the action to uh, be, uh, I mean, before the drought season uh, to prevent the bushfire in Zalai. However, it it has not been institutionalized in the DIM system, uh, but rather depending on the view or the wills of the leaders. Uh, the second challenge is a limited budget from the government for the DIM, which constrains the uh, budget uh, allocation for early action. And uh, we also found that uh, with a newly established uh, provincial DIR fund, uh, it could be a potential funding sources for early action. However, at the moment, the mechanism for early uh, for funding early action has not been integrated into the funding criteria of the DR funding of the DR fund, and also the limited coordination between the DIM and the social protection agencies. Um, so that is some of the some of the experience that. Um, when we implemented the um, uh, the FBF, uh, the early action, early warning early action project in Vietnam, and also the uh, catch and for for the COVID. That was great, Tuyen, to hear about the experience in the Philippines, uh, the experience in the Vietnam, sorry, and we'd like to switch now and hear about the experience in the Philippines. Um, so, the, I mean, the Philippines is often held up as an example of really good progress with shock response and social protection. Um, and I think we certainly found that the Philippines had systems in place that were ready to be used when COVID struck. Um, so how can we build on that to make a system that is actually more anticipatory and ex ante? So lots of the examples we've seen around the world of shock responsive social protection in relation to COVID was it was all still arranged after the, the main impact of the shock <clears throat> was part of us trying to figure out how to respond to it. What could we do to make um, the systems actually be more anticipatory um, and ex ante? Okay. Um, thank you, Zoe. Um, I hope I'm coming in clearly. Um, but before I respond to your question, let me just give a brief background also about uh, the Bang Samoro region. No? Um, because some of our participants here may not be very familiar with it. Um, so uh, in the Bang Samoro region, which is a pr predominantly Muslim, no? uh, and they are a minority here in the country. Um, 
communities are affected by recurring displacement due to ongoing armed conflict, clan feuds, and natural disasters. Um, this perennially Im impacts over a million people annually. No? Um, Bangsamoro families who are forced to flee because of conflict become even more vulnerable with the occurrence of natural disasters. Many are repeatedly displaced and have no regular access to basic social services, physical and legal protection, and natural disasters put more people's lives at risk. Um, to ensure that poor and vulnerable families are given the protection and assistance they need, um, the Ministry of Social Services and Development of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, or MSSD BARM, has strengthened its regular programming and implementation of its disaster risk reduction and emergency assistance program. This includes the provision of welfare goods, assistance for individuals in crisis situations, um, primarily for hospitalization, medicines, burial, or even fire victims. Um, we, we've also been providing uh, water sanitation and hygiene and cash-based in interventions, as well as humanitarian tra transfers of distressed individuals. Um, very recently, um, let me just focus on uh, Zoe's question. No? Uh, uh, let me focus on the anticipatory action of the anticipatory action program of the ministry, where we are targeting to provide at least ten thousand families. Uh, with multi-purpose cash assistance under our newest program. Um, there's a local term, no? paghanda at pagbabalik, uh, which, is, which basically translates to uh, paghanda is preparation and pagbabalik is return. No? Uh, the cash assistance may be used in anticipation and preparation for potential disasters, which translates to paghanda no, before the actual disaster strikes, or it may be used as part of the recovery package or pagbabalik. Once the IDPs, the internally displaced families, return to their places of origin or settles in new areas. This is fully funded under the Bangsamoro government's 2022 budget. I think this is an update from the last time we spoke to Zoe. Um, anyway, the purpose of this program is to minimize the risk and mitigate the effects of disasters and address the pressing needs during the crisis. The program also aims to support families in their recovery from the disaster or displacement. Last month, March 2022, the ministry commenced the distribution of cash transfers as part of the anticipatory action or the provision of immediate assistance ahead of a disaster or crisis to mitigate the impact of shocks. Beneficiaries of the anticipatory action cash transfers were able to collect their cash grants from a third party financial service provider or a cash payout center. Um, specifically, we utilize these pawn shops as, uh, or that are being used as remittance centers ordinarily, no? but we use them as a cash payout center. The program was piloted in six municipalities in Maguindanao in the BARM with 7,448 beneficiaries in an area that experiences recurring displacement of civilian communities due to armed conflict or flooding. This pilot program was funded by UNICEF and FAO under the joint program on the sustainable development goals on leave no one behind. The JPSRSP or the joint program shock responsive social protection addresses the risks and vulnerabilities that the Bangsamoro people, especially the poor, poorest, most vulnerable and marginalized, face in times of natural and human-induced disasters that perpetuate the cycle of poverty. The JPSRSP enhances BARM's, BARM's existing social protection systems to better target and deliver assistance before and immediately after a crisis becomes a full-blown disaster. The JPSRSP focused on three key interventions that include mainstreaming risk-informed shock-responsive social protection as part of the 
uh, long-term Bangsamoro Development Plan, building the capacity of BARM's institutions to analyze and monitor both natural and human-induced risk and improve synergy. And lastly, um, the last one is being implemented by, the, by MSSD, improving the poverty registry system to include risk and hazard, vulnerability assessments, predictive analytics, inclusive targeting, and effective monitoring. The learnings from the pilot program on the anticipatory action, cash distribution, shall inform the development and fine tuning of the ministry's guidelines for the Paghanda and Pagbabalik program, where MSSD shall provide assistance in the form of cash or vouchers as part of the anticipatory action or preparation for the disaster and as part of the early recovery package as displaced families return to their uh, places of origin or settles in new areas. Um, I hope that answers your question, Zoe. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're a little bit over on time, so I'm going to uh, very uh, speedily hand over to Catherine, who is going to take us through the questions and answers. It's been great to see some questions come coming in. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Zoe. Yeah, we've got a range of great questions and thanks team for, for putting them into the Q&A chat to allow us to go a little bit deeper into to what anticipatory action and shock response of social protection and cash transfers, that's a sentence and a half, mean for our, our space at the moment. So I'm going to jump straight into it because of time and hopefully we can answer one or two. Just want to add the, the kind of pretense that we will be answering these questions in a report as well afterwards if we can't reach to them um, today. So um, I might invite Emma to the floor. I've got a question for you as well um, from our colleagues at UNICEF. Um, one was that privatization of public goods such as provision of social protection is undesirable for social progress. However, it seems this is the way to go for proponents of anticipatory action. Isn't this a contradiction? What is the role for the state and private sectors such as insurance companies? Um, Emma, over to you. Thanks, Catherine. I think that's a really interesting question. It's actually not one I've come up against before. I think the first thing to say is that I don't think that early action is um, um, kind of inherently is pro or anti privatization at all. I think definitely it means engagement for the private sector because for some of the financing instruments that we want, might want to use for anticipatory approaches, you know, we need to look at things like insurance. Um, which is done by the private sector um, and they have all the kind of operational history on it, but then they need to work with humanitarian organizations, with governments, so that we can adjust these um, approaches to be more, you know, in service of people rather than necessarily the market. So I don't think that, um, I wouldn't say that anticipatory action requires privatization of government functions at all, but it does require that kind of, that insurance or that private sector engagement. And I think that there's really positive examples of this um, already emerging. I mean, in the ASEAN region, also in Africa with things like the ARC insurance, um, the ARC insurance policies where governments, you know, sovereign governments can take out um, an insurance policy. Um, but the other thing is that I think for anticipatory action and linked anticipatory action and so shock response and social protection, um, mechanisms to, to work. What we really need is a layered approach to financing. And um, there is no um, one size fits all or one sort of financial or funding um, solution to, to fit them all. We Risks are layered. They vary enormously in, in severity and scope um, and frequency. And many countries, as particularly ASEAN countries, are experiencing several different kinds of risks of different intensity at different times. So we need risk financing that responds to that complexity and is layered and, and, and is layered accordingly. So, you know, we do want governments to be able to have um, within the constraints of PFM to have the capacity to, to, to you know, to fund their social um, protection schemes, to make them shock responsive and to fund early action. Um, but humanitarian or CSO organizations um, will still need to retain a risk uh, capacity to take anticipatory action, um, either for smaller crises um, or for complex crises where we need everybody on board, essentially. And the private sector is um, 
you know, I think sometimes there's a reluctance on the humanitarian side to engage in the private sector because we see it sort of as this famous, but actually the private sector is really involved in the government, in the economy of a country and is uh, probably a bigger contributor to GDP. Um, and has stronger links with the government. So we all have, there is a space for everybody within this space and a responsibility and also um, a need, a need for everybody to have some sort of capacity to respond. And I think the private sector or private financial institutions offer part of the solution for that. Not all of the solution, but certainly part of it, particularly when, we look at, when we're looking at those big crises um, that are beyond any sort of um, existing national coping capacity. Hopefully that gets somewhere to answer that question. Thanks, back to you, Catherine. No, that's perfect, Emma. Thank you so much. I also love that you touched upon kind of the humanitarian development nexus in some way and brought in the, the private sector into that. I think that was really well woven in to kind of conceptualize that answer. So thank you so much, Emma. I really appreciate your time. Um, Zoe, I'm going to call you back to the floor. I'm sorry, we thought you were going to have a break, but I'm going to call you back. Um, beyond, so we've got one question that is beyond changing some anti-corruption laws, what are other specific changes to public financial management are required to deliver anticipatory action through social protection systems? So over to you, Zoe. Um, okay, so I, I would give another, I mean, I think um, another good example um, of, of where we have to pay attention to this issue of the flow of funds is when using, uh, when using insurance, for example. So uh, the Philippines uh, recently, with support from the World Bank, bought parametric ca catastrophe insurance for Typhoon, I think. I don't know this um, that well, but I, I read the evaluation report from it. So it's just this, this issue really of you need to uh, tie up how you're getting the money in to a, to a country with how you're going to get it to flow through government systems and get it out to people at the end. And sometimes we're good at doing the, the beginning and the end of the chain, but we forget to do the bit in the middle. And I think the um, example of the Philippines um, buying insurance, it was part of a World Bank uh, project supporting parametric catastrophe insurance, was that the money was paid to the national government, but the plan was for it to be... Uh, and, and the two bits didn't connect very well. They, they needed to do more work on the public to get it to flow through the government system. So that would be, um, I, I think it's a case for any situation where you're trying to um, access money for shock responsive social protection or anticipatory actions, you need to think, how do you get it through the system? Thanks so much for um, reinforcing that point, Zoe, and confirming we heard the whole entire answer. So thanks so oh, much. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I know, persevering through it all. So thank you so much, Zoe, for that. Um, with, the, with the time now not on our side, I'm going to move quickly to Dr. Rianti to, to answer one question, hopefully in a couple of minutes. I think it might take longer, but hopefully you can um, provide us with a few kind of recommendations to this. So Dr. Rianti, if you don't mind taking the floor to answer this question, I'm sure that uh, the ASEAN have reviewed the Admiral work plan previously, I, I still see the NDMO in the countries have no proper trigger point to define their anticipatory action. How does the ASEAN Secretariat um, plan to reinforce this? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Yanti, if you don't mind providing a few words to that question, that would be great. I, I think to, uh, to answer this or respond to this uh, quickly, uh, we will uh, have more elaboration on the trigger points, uh, which we discuss in the development of the ASEAN framework or anticipatory action. There are, of course, in between uh, with during the consultative process that that is question on you know what kind of trigger points you would you like to decide uh, but of course it's important to know uh, at the ASEAN level uh, these frameworks give guidance on implementation at the regional level with some consideration of uh, uh, you know for implementation at the at the national level however you know uh, this is understanding that there are more coordination needed at the national level, for example, to decide on this, uh, you know, definition or decision on this trigger point. I think that's uh, to answer this question quickly. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rianti. Really appreciate it. And, and yeah, exactly. At the national level, that's where all of this will kind of happen. And we, we hopefully can get that coordination and moving forward to get these systems more sustainable at that country level as we move forward into the future. So thank you, Dr. Rianti, for your intervention there. Um, we are now reaching the end of our webinar and many thanks to all who participated and provided interesting insights into what we have learned and, and really gathering and kind of meditating on that, but also critically looking at where are we going and where do we need to go? And I feel like this conversation allowed us to have those two hats on, really taking back, this is where we've come from, but where we also need to go as a community. And before I pass the floor to Dr. Rianti to close us off with some final reflections, I wanna flag a few things for questions that have not had time to address, as I was mentioning before, we will make sure to address them in our webinar report of the session that will be sent out to everyone that registered for the webinar. Um, as indicated earlier, the presentation has been recorded. The recording together with the related resources that you've seen popping up into the chat feed that the Zoom team has very kindly managed to do systematically um, will be available soon in the link in the chat box. It should be also appearing now. So you can link into that and you can see all the goodies that have been discussed today as well as the, the recorded link that will be hosted there. And please let us know if you've got any thoughts or feedback on this webinar, um, following also the link in the chat. We're always warmly welcome um, feedback on these processes and how we can do better. So don't be shy and, and, and manage to, to provide some recommendations there. But once again, I want to thank our speakers, our panelists, Zoe as well, um, for joining us today and really going through this important topic. And I look forward to doing more of these sessions with the, this community in the future. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Rianti to provide us with some closing reflection, reflections for the webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Rianti, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, allow me to give some of the reflection that will be relevant uh, for our implement follow up implementation. One thing that we noted here is uh, the issue on the coherence. Uh, we are trying to ensure that the ASEAN key framework, ASEAN agreement on disaster management, ASEAN declaration and uh, on uh, and regional implementation framework on social protection are some of the guiding uh, uh, higher guiding documents to ensure coherence uh, of this work. We notice. Uh, on the issue of uh, terminology uh, here, you know, how do you define anticipatory action? Um, what are the trigger points? Uh, how, uh, uh, like, this is also something that we have uh, noted and also discussed uh, in development of our uh, incoming framework. On the third issue on strategic and sustainable financing, I have shown uh, some uh, exam or some example or elaboration on ASEAN disaster risk finance and insurance. There are, we noted there are major consideration of uh, shock responsive social protection and anticipatory action for consideration of uh, uh, in de the development of uh, ASEAN disaster risk finance and insurance. This is where uh, ACDM will take this forward. Uh, we noted some of the recommendations that were highlighted uh, on the results of this study. Indeed, um, in the uh, incoming uh, uh, framework on anticipatory action, we, we are considering some of these uh, recommendations as part of our uh, action planning. Thank you very much on the uh, examples given on the cash transfer. You know, how do we strengthen capacity for SSRP? How do we ensure inclusivity is ensured? Some examples of social assistant package affected by COVID. Um, the challenge is that, you know, uh, lessons from this uh, various member state, how do we then uh, scale this up at the regional level so that we can implement this uh, regional framework on anticipatory action. So to close, uh, ASEAN Secretariat would like to thank uh, the ACDM Chair, uh, ACDM Vice Chair and members uh, joining today, particularly to the co-chairs of Working Group PNM for their leadership in the engagement on the works on the development of ASEAN guidelines on disaster responsive social protection to increase resilience and their continued engagement on anticipatory action, which lead to the development of the ASEAN framework on anticipatory action and disaster management which we plan to be launched uh, at the ASEAN Partners event at the sidelines of GPDRR in May 2022 in Bali. So our sincere thanks uh, to Power Up who has engaged with ACDM throughout this journey supported by DJ ECHO. So your support um, as part of ASEAN uh, UN uh, Joint Strategic Plan of Action in Disaster Management uh, will greatly support the implementation of the ATMOR Work Program 2021-2025 
We also would like to thank Asia Pacific Technical Working Group on anticipatory action where your cooperation and broader supports to ASEAN in advancing the, the agenda on the RSP and uh, anticipatory action. So finally, we are thankful uh, of the, for the work workshop participants today. It is an honor that ASEAN can share our work to the public uh, as part of our vision to be the global leader in disaster management by 2025. So have a good evening, everyone.